be seated, church. And as we take our seats this morning, let's grab our Bibles and let's turn to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11. Now, some of you have probably, who are very astute, have already seen that uh, we cut one of the songs out this morning. And you know that's because last week I uh, was scheduled to preach uh, Hebrews 11, verses 29 through 40, and I got one verse done. That's all I got. <laughs> I'm just kidding you. That is not why we, we had to do that. But it does mean I have more time than I normally would. And no doubt we will finish in Hebrews 11, uh, verses 29, uh, down to at least verse 35 this morning. In your notes, you're very clear as to what we're studying in this book about the person of Christ, God's very best to us, his priesthood, and this chapters we are in now, the last section of the book, this principle of what it means to live by faith. And each week we have learned that there is in verses 4 through 40, after he describes what faith is like in verses 1 through 3, he then tells us what it looks like, how it's displayed. And it's always best to see it lived out in the lives of people. And so we understand that it begins like Abel with an act of worship where you come by the sacrifice. Ours is the sacrifice of Christ that introduces you to God, leads you to the place to where you are forgiven and you're reconciled. And then you begin to do like Enoch in chapter 11. You walk with God, you seek him, you seek to be in step with him. Then like Noah, you know that as you walk with him, God's gonna use you to serve him and like Noah, Noah, you're going to work and serve him in his purposes. Abraham is an example of sometimes God calls you to the ultimate surrender of the greatest and the dearest thing in your life to you. But by faith, you can do that because you know, as you learned in the life of Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, that this is the most important thing to serve him at any cost and all costs and to pass that on to your children. Because when you're gone, you want them to find in you that you have been faithful to follow and give everything you have to this God. Moses shows us, showed us what it looked like to pursue the wealth of faith. You seize eternal treasures. You really honestly can give up on anything in this world as something you must have, you think will satisfy you. And you, like Moses, pursue the eternal riches of Christ and the kingdom of God in those things. Then last week, where we were in verse 29 of Hebrews 11, we moved from the individuals of the first 28 verses Abraham and Noah and Jacob and all these individuals to now the group. And the group begins in verse 29 and goes through verse 40 and shows us that now he's not really focusing in this last section of Hebrews 11 on individuals who walk by faith, but people, the Israelites. If you just notice as you've read through your verses there, verses 29 through 40, you'll see that phrase over and over again, they. They conquered kingdoms. They surrendered to this. They stood against lions and all that. They and all these he keeps referring to is really pointing us to the Israelites. And so where we're coming this morning is back to this section, verses 29 through 40. We're going to continue as we remember really what does it look like to have courageous faith. Now just remember this. This is such an important transition, and I want to make sure you understand this. When in verse 29, we read about them passing through the Red Sea, and then in verse 30, them coming to the walls of Jericho, the Israelites in verse 29 are different than the group of Israelites in verse 30. Verse 29 are those who had come out of Egypt after the blood was shed and God had rescued them from slavery. The blood of the lamb kept them from their firstborn being killed. They were let go. They came out of uh, Egypt. And as they did, they came to the Red Sea. They went through the Red Sea. Miraculously, God brought them off. And then that group of Israelites were headed towards the promised land. But as you know, that group of Israelites are the ones who remained 40 years in the wilderness as grumblers and complainers. To them, Jericho was something too big for them. It was something that they could never, ever, ever handle. So for 40 years, we know that after they came out of Egypt and the Passover and the Red Sea, after that, it was 40 years later that we come to verse 30 and the second generation of the Israelites coming up to the walls of Jericho. And just as a reminder, isn't it a sad thing to think about? that that first generation, the last act of faith they ever did was believing God could take them across the Red Sea. 
the waters to open up for them and them to come across. What an amazing thing. That is the very last act of faith that that generation had ever done. From that point on, they doubted God and they doubted his promises. For them, they were the kind of people, the people of God, who fell into the trap of thinking, if God will give me proof, if God will give me a little glimpse that he's going to do something, we'll trust him. But let me just remind you of this. The person, the man, the woman, the boy or girl, the believer who lives by faith, truly lives by faith, doesn't need any proof to trust God. No proof at all. You know, in reality, if you really go around looking for signs, looking for proof, like the, that generation who died in the wilderness, really what you have is doubt, just looking for evidence that you should believe something. You're looking for proof for a proof that God really will do it. He says, true faith just takes God at his word. Now, I don't want to misunderstand this. There are times that God does give us reasons why he wants us to do something, right? In his word, he tells us why to do something and why we should obey him. But he is never, listen to this, under obligation to always tell you why you should trust him. There are Many of those times where our life of faith falls into that Deuteronomy 29, 29 context to where this is the secret thing. It belongs to God. I don't know why this is going on. I don't know what he's going to do, but I do know this. I'm going to just trust his word no matter what sign, what proof, what evidence comes my way that it looks like he's working in the end. If he said he would do it, he's going to do it. And that's what verse 30 going forward is about. These people who really did believe that, who really trusted that God would do just what he said. It's kind of like God says this, you do what I tell you to do, trust me, obey me, and I'll do what I said I will do. And that's the way this unfolds here. And we learned this last week as we came to verse 30 and the walls of Jericho. And this is really important to think about because this generation now is a generation of Israelites who really has what I like to refer to as courageous faith. They're not coming to Jericho because their signs are proof that God will do it. They have the same evidence, the same truth, the same word that their fathers before them had. But now this group of believers actually has the courage and the confidence to say, if God said he would do something, then we're going to do what he said to do. And we'll trust him to work out how that all comes together. And I'm always intrigued about stories of courageous faith. How many of you have heard of the missionary Robert Moffat? You ever heard that name before? Robert Moffat was a missionary who served in South Africa for many years. And he served there for a long time. And there was not one convert to his ministry. But God had promised in his word that he would save sinners, right? He's got people from every kindred, every tongue, every tribe, and every nation. So his friends in England wrote to him and said, uh, Mr. Moffat, what would you like for us to mail you as a gift? We'd like to encourage you. He said, mail me a communion set. <laughs> and there's not one believer in the town. He's the only believer. But he goes about faithfully doing what God says, preaching the gospel, sharing Christ. Believing that what God says, that from every kindred, every tongue, every tribe and nation, you're going to save some people. There's got to be some of these South Africans who are going to come to Christ. And by the time the communion set arrived, he had at least 12 believers ready to celebrate their very first communion. That is courageous faith. And that's what's happening in verse 30 going forward. And I want to read our text for you just to set it. And we're going to jump right into this and see what we can learn again about courageous faith. Verse 30, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient after she had welcomed the spies in peace. And what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, but far, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. And I drew a line in my Bible right there because at that point, when he talks about others, he's going to talk about some others who didn't have quite a, quote, successful experience of conquering big walls like Jericho, shutting the mouths of lions. Their situation was totally different. 
from verse 35 beyond. It's another group, but they are courageous as well. We'll come to them next week. But this morning, we're going to come back, if you look on your outline, and pick up with this courage to have faith in the midst of some of the most challenging struggles the children of Israel face. As we already learned last week, that first struggle was Joshua and the Israelites as they came to Jericho. You remember that was a fortified city. We learned about how that it was so massive that the walls were wide enough that two chariots could ride side by side on the top of it. So there's no way these Israelites who are slaves out of Egypt, who don't have a standing army, who have no weapons, are going to penetrate that massive wall. So they do what God says. He tells them to go and march around the wall. Now they're afraid because their mom and dad had heard this story 40 years earlier and they have heard the story that they are like grasshoppers in the sights of these people in Jericho. They're just too big for us. We could never in our own strength conquer them. So just like you, just like me, they face these challenges that they're fearful of how they're going to do it. But what did they do? They did just what God said. They obeyed his word, marched around the city. On that final and last day, they shouted. Uh, they, sh they marched seven times around the wall, shouted, and God made the walls come down. And they did all that just out of sheer obedience. They did what God said to do, and he did what he said he would do. And they did it all by faith. Now that brings us to the next character because the story of Jericho is not over just because we hear the story about uh, the walls falling down. There's another character that comes into the story, and she is equally an important part of courageous faith, though in a different way than it is with the children of Israel around the walls of Jericho. And if you'll look in verse 30, you'll see who she is. Verse 31, rather. By faith, Rahab, and most people would like to just scratch that next phrase out. By faith, Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient after she had welcomed the spies in peace. Now, if there is one verse that you probably should just pause for a little bit and think about, it's that one in this section here. It is the most unlikely person you would think of to be in the hall of faith here. To be someone that God would say, let me show you this woman named Rahab. And by the way, she was a prostitute who is listed as a woman of courageous faith and is connected with what happened in Jericho. We know on the outside what happened with the children of Israel as they came to that wall and they were obediently following God, walking around the wall, saying nothing, just being quiet, waiting on the time when God said to shout and those walls would fall. But here is somebody on the inside, somebody on the inside who is a prostitute, who is running a brothel. And, 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 and that just means she is running a house where it is filled with a lot of prostitutes. It is a place where men come for sex. That's the house she runs. And she's listed here as someone who you want to be like. <laughs> Not as a prostitute, right? <laughs> but as her faith and her story of redemption and rescue. I just couldn't help it as we were singing those songs. Songs thinking, I bet you if Rahab was here, she would be going, yes, that's the God. That is the God I know who rescued me. And I'm in that line just like Abraham and Noah and Abel and all the others that have been listed because of something that transpired in my heart inside the walls of Jericho. And I became one of those who became a believer and a follower of God and his son, Christ. So if verse 30 in Jericho is about the walls, verse 31 shows us about the corruption of a culture in which she lives in. And it's a picture of a city here that is absolutely the most defiled, wicked place Rahab could have ever grown up. It's really no wonder, really, that she was a prostitute and she did what she did because of the culture in which she found herself in. They were noted, this city was, as a city that was grossly immoral. It was perverted with all kinds of sexual practices and which is the context of this morning. I'm not even going to mention what kind of things they did in that city. You can go read about it. You can see what they did, but there is nothing they did that, that is not being done today in sexual perversions. They did it as well as they were generally known as a city filled with cruelty and barbaric ways of behavior. Among other things, they frequently, listen to this one, put live babies in jars and built them into the walls of their city. They called them foundational sacrifices. 
given over to their pleasure, giving over to every sexual perversion and sin and greediness they could and making sure that they got the gods, the deities on their side to make sure that they would be protected against any problems that came their way. And this sounds bizarre to us, but listen, I'm going to tell you something. This kind of stuff still goes on in the world in which we live in today. may not be happening in Raven County, not across America, but when you leave this country and you go to other places, you will find the same kind of stuff going on. When I was in Uganda last year, I went by a temple, an ancestral temple of worship. And in that temple, they are sacrificing still animals to take the blood, to place on the graves of their ancestors, to make sure that the ancestral gods will be favorable to them. I was going by a place where a building was being built and one of the, the Ugandans said, in that place, they'll be putting blood in the foundation to make sure the blessings of the gods are for them. In fact, some have gone so far to actually abduct children on the streets. And if you've ever go in a third world country, you'll see kids everywhere. They will abduct some of those children. Nobody knows where they go. And it's believed that sometimes because of the severe need to make sure that the gods are on their side, they will take those children, sacrifice them, put their blood in the foundation. That's a culture that's still active in Uganda. So here is a corrupt city. Jericho, we could really rightly say, was ripe for judgment. Everything against what God would want a people to be, they were. In fact, when the walls of Jericho fall down, you might want to jot this down. In Joshua chapter 6, verse 26, it says, Joshua laid an oath on them. This is after the walls are down. They've conquered it. At that time saying, cursed before the Lord be the man who rises up and rebuilds this city, Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn shall he lay its foundation, and at the cost of his youngest son shall he set up its gates. In other words, if you try to put this city back up, it is so bad, God will do everything to go against you. That's the corruption of the city. But I want you to know something about this city, and I want you to take your Bible and turn back in the Old Testament to where we find this Joshua chapter 2. And I want to point out a couple things about the story that it's not really highlighted in Hebrews 11. Just one verse summarizes a bunch that took place. But go to the book of Joshua, it's right after the book of Deuteronomy, and turn to chapter 2. And I want you to notice something here. It's a corrupt city, it's a wicked city, but it's also a city, and I put in your notes there this, it was a confronted city. And what I mean by a confronted city is that God himself had already made known to them enough of who he was that the whole city could have and should have believed upon him. Look with me, if you will, Joshua chapter two, verses one through seven. Then Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men as spies secretly from Shittim, saying, Go view this land, specifically Jericho. So they went and came into the house of a harlot whose name was Rahab and lodged there. It was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men from the sons of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. And the king of Jericho sent word to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them, and she said, Yes, the men came to me, but I do not know where they were from. I did not know where they were from. Verse 5. It came about when it was time to shut the gate at dark that the men went out. I do not know where they went out. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But... She had brought them up to the roof and hidden them in the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order on the roof. So the men pursued them on the road to, Jer to Jordan, to the forge. And as soon as, she, as those who were pursuing them had gone out, they shut the gate. I'm not even going to deal with her line right there, okay? I'm not even going to deal with that one. That's, that is not my point. My point I want to underscore, though, is that the whole city knew that this, the children of Israel, the spies, were in their city. They knew that. What was on the king's mind, what was on his conscience, was he thought about what was going on is, where are those people who have come to spy out our land? That's all that was on his mind. Now go, if you will, now to verse 8 and notice what's on Rahab's mind, and I no doubt on other people's minds, possibly in the city. Verse 8. Now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the, to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the terror of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. 
For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were before the Jordan to Shihon and Og whom you utterly destroyed. Verse 11, when we heard it, our hearts melted and no courage remained in any of man any longer because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. I hope you didn't miss something of significance right there. What is Rahab telling them about the God that has melted their heart, that has brought terror to them? It's not the God just at the Jordan. It goes a little further back, right? It goes back to the Red Sea. Remember, the first generation is the generation that said, oh, we're like grasshopper. This wall is too big. The city is too big. We cannot do this. There's no way we're going to win this battle. And they grumbled and they complained for 40 years. Now, listen, while they are over here grumbling and complaining for 40 years, inside the walls of Jericho, it says in the text, their hearts were melting. They feared him more than the people of God did. They were shaken. And in the city, when it came up, oh, you know that Red Sea story? Oh, yeah, that is the true God. That is the God of heaven. And when we think about how powerful and how awesome he is in his judgment on Egypt, we are shaking. So in the first seven verses, the king, all he can think about is, where are those people who are against us? Who is that? Where are they? Find them for me. Rahab is like, no, what's capturing me is the God of heaven. That's who captures me. That's who's got my attention. Now, why am I saying this to you? That all points in these first verses here to the fact that this city is a confronted city. They know enough of God. Rahab knows enough of God that it strikes terror and fear in her heart that she's going to turn from herself and from her sin to that God. You see, when you look at Jericho and all their wickedness and all they had done and all their perversions and all their brutality and lack of value for life and children and everything else, it wasn't like they were over there going, I didn't know any better. They knew better. They knew there was an accountability to the God of heaven and they knew that they were culpable to that God, responsible and accountable to him. It's just like in Romans 1, right? Romans 1 talks about people that when they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, but became vain in their imagination and kept turning further and further away from him. You see, it is enough just to know that God is and that he exists to make you accountable and culpable to him. And Jericho is a city that's confronted with the knowledge of a God that they ultimately owe their allegiance to, that they owe their accountability to. And they, in the first seven verses, with the king are running around caring less about that God. But Rahab is a different person. So notice what she did. The King James says that Rahab, the harlot, in verse uh, 11, Hebrews 11, verse 31, says that Rahab, the harlot, did not perish along with those who were disobedient. The King James says those that believed not. And I, and I like the translation of the King James Version there because what it does is it shows you that their disobedience was tied to not believing this God and turning to him in faith. She didn't perish, but they did. You still have your Bible open there in Joshua chapter 2. Let me read verse um, uh, uh, 12 going forward. Now, therefore, Rahab says saying, I've heard of this God. Several times she says, verse 10, I heard of him. Verse 11, we heard of him. Verse 12, now, therefore, please swear to me by the Lord, since I have dealt kindly with you, that you also will deal kindly with my father's house uh, and give me a pledge of truth and spare my father and my mother, my brothers and my sisters with all who belong to them and deliver our life from death. It's not just physical death. It's the sense that this God who has judged the, the, the Egyptians is a God to be feared. He's a God that when you have turned against him, you've refused him. When you're disobedient to that God and you care nothing about that God, you have placed yourself under his severe and just and furious wrath. And she is saying, please, please, I don't want that. I mean, I tried to whittle this down in my own thinking how that might have in my language been said if I was there. Maybe Rahab said to them, listen, I know who that God is. I've heard about him. 
We've talked about him. Our hearts melt when we think about who, how great and powerful and awesome and holy and accountable we are to him and his judgment that's surely going to come like it did to, to the Egyptians, now to the cities of Jericho. I know that. I don't want to be a part of this corrupt culture. I don't want to belong to this anymore. I want to turn from my sin. I want to come. I want to believe. I want him to spare me. I think it would sound maybe something like this. So, guys, can I come with you? Would your God accept someone like me? Can I be your first convert in the land of Canaan? And they said, absolutely, come on. That's the God we serve. A God who has set his love on every kindred and every tongue and every tribe and every nation. The most wicked, the most perverse, the most corrupt sinner you could think of right here in the book of Hebrews by faith was spared. She didn't perish. She didn't fall under his judgment because she turned by faith to this God. And I want the strength of that to really come home to you. Uh, some people try to translate in the Old Testament the fact that she was a harlot, that she was an innkeeper. Yeah, that's exactly what they try to do. They try to say, well, you know, and they're trying to, as it were, soften the edges of the story. Because they would say that the Hebrew word for harlot can be translated innkeeper, and they were often a part of the same industry. But the word harlot used by the writer of Hebrews in chapter 11 is the same word that James uses about Rahab in chapter 2, verse 25. And there he calls her a prostitute. The word is porne. You get the idea of what it's about. It's about sexual sins and pornography. Fornication, that was Rahab. Rahab, listen, brothers and sisters, she wasn't running a bed and breakfast in here, right? She is running a brothel. She's not running an Airbnb. She is running a house of ill repute. That is what she's doing. She's running a place where men come for sexual pleasure. Why well, soften the story? This is the point of her glorious story that God demonstrated his grace to an unlikely prospect who then becomes the most unlikely person in her entire city to believe. And yet she does. By faith, Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient because she wasn't disobedient. She believed and so she separated herself as we read there in Joshua chapter 2 verses 8 through 13. That's what she did. By faith, Rahab the harlot did not perish after she had welcomed the spies in peace. It's the whole picture there in Hebrews 11 of her welcoming God's people, identifying herself with the people of God and the God of those people to say, I believe like you, and she trusted. Now let's go back to Hebrews 11, because I want to finish up here in these final few moments by looking at another group of Israelites. So as we, we think about the Israelites here, and we think in verse 30 about Jericho and Joshua and the Israelites there. And then we think about Rahab and the Israelites there. I want you to notice that there's another group here and they are simply referred to others. Look at verse 32. And what more shall I say for time will fail me if I tell you, and then he lists six people's names. He lists six people's names here and they become as it were, just rapid fire examples of indifferent context as Israelites, how they were courageous and they truly trusted God. Now, I love that little phrase there. You're gonna have to pardon me for a moment and just tell you why I like this. And what more shall I say for time will fail me if I tell you of these, he says. Remember the, the letter to the Hebrews was ri originally written as a sermon, right? It was delivered as a sermon. And this is one of those places in the book of Hebrews where you get the feel for kind of how a preacher would do something, right? He's been going on and talking about these things and he finally says, I'd like to say more, right? <laughs> There's more I could say, but time is gonna fail me. And I'm looking at my clock and I'm telling you, time is failing me right now. But I want you to walk through these different individuals that are listed here from this verse, verse 32, on down to verse 35. And I want you to think with me about how their lives are examples of courageous 
faith, courageous faith. One thing you might want to note, there's no chronological order to them. So don't go, well, this was before him or after him. Don't worry about the chronology of it because it's not about the chronology of their life. It's not, necess not necessarily about what they did in their office that they occupied, but their faith in the midst of some challenging moments that they found themselves. So look, first of all, at verse 32 pretty quickly. He says, let me mention just Gideon. And what I've done is I've thought about each of these men as what they do and demonstrate about courageous faith. And I think the story of Gideon demonstrated a faith in God's plan that replaces the physical limitations he was challenged with. You say, what do you mean the physical limitations that he was challenged with? Well, remember, Gideon by trade was, a, anybody know what he was before he took hold of leading the battle? What was he? A farmer. That's right. He was a farmer. And when God called him to come and lead the battle against the Midianites and the Amalekites, which were 135,000 people, the first thing he did is he went and he found a, 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 a like a, a silo and hid himself in it because he was scared to death. It wasn't like he was like, yeah, God, man, he conquered Jericho, got Rahab out of there, let's go. He wasn't like that. He wasn't initially showing courageous faith. So he went and he hid himself and he was afraid. And so as we, the story unfolds, and you can read all about him in Judges 6 through 8. That's a rather lengthy section to read, and we won't this morning. But here we are um, with a man who is scared to death, and he somewhat must have been uncertain that God really chose him. You know how we know that? He's the guy that goes and gets the fleece. Remember that story? Okay, I'm going to lay this fleece out here. Now, you probably did, but I want to make double sure before I get to go do this. He lays the fleece out in the morning. He says, the fleece was wet with dew and the ground all around it was dry. And he said, if that's the way it works out, then I'll go along with you. And what happened? He comes and that's exactly what happened, right? He said, well, maybe that was just a lucky chance right there. So let's reverse this whole thing and make it happen just the opposite. And so he did and he did. God did. Both times in the fleece assured him that he was supposed to do this. Let me give you a little side note there. That's not the way to know God's will, by the way. That's the way he's trying to, fig, trying to, to really just look for a sign and proof that God wants him to do it. Uh, that's not a man of faith. That's a man of fear right there. That's a man who said, you got to show me. you got to give me a fleece. Answer me that way. That's not the way to know and do God's will. So Gideon finally is convinced and all of his fear and all of his running away from God, that God is going to use him. So what does Gideon do? He pulls together 32,000 men to fight 135,000 other people, okay? But God comes along and says, no, um, I'm going to whittle your army down, Gideon. In fact, I want you to take all of those 32,000 and whittle them down to 10,000. And then I want those 10,000 men to go down to the water to get a drink. What an interesting way to figure out who's going to be the real Gideon army. So he says, those who get down like a dog on their knees on all four and drink, those are the ones that are not going with you. Well, what that really indicates is, is they're not paying attention to what's going on around them. They just got their hands and their face in the water, getting the water. So when those got down on their knees, 9,700 out of the 10,000 were cut out of the army. <laughs> and you got 300 left. What a crazy thing, right? <laughs> 300 guys left, and that's going to be the, the army. Now, what is it that Gideon's going to use to win this battle? He's going to use for his weapon trumpets and lanterns. That's it. <laughs> we're here, guys. We're here. Now, this farmer, who is now turned judge, didn't run at this point. Even after God revealed his battle strategy of broken clay pitchers and torches and trumpets, here is a guy who literally trusted God to win the battle. Here's the point. All of us sometimes will say, well, I don't know if I'm able to do that. That's just too big for me. That's going to be too hard. I'm not capable to face that issue. Courageous faith will replace that kind of limitation with, but God is able. That's what it does. Next in the list is Barak. And he says in, in this verse here that he is one of those, and I've chosen to choose him as a demonstration of a faith that removes his personal pride. You see, God, when he's doing something in most difficult circumstances that you cannot accomplish, your limitations are weak and you are not able to, it's not like you're 300 or powerful against 135,000. This is God really doing this. 
that he does that, and we see in the life of Barak, to teach you that he wants to hammer your pride and remove any sense of you feeling like you did something to win the battle. And you can read Barak's story in Judges 4 and 5, and it's uh, the only place he's mentioned, and then in Hebrews 12, verse 32, he is mentioned again. So here is a man named Barak who is called to lead the troops into battle against a warlord named Sisera. Remember Sisera, that guy who is the warlord of the area, and uh, he's the one who is, uh, has the uh, Canaanites as, as the king. Well, long story short, God tells Barak that they're going to win this battle. But do you remember when he tells him that he's going to win the battle, who's ultimately going to conquer the main king, Caesarea? You know who's going who's to do that? Anybody remember? A woman. <laughs> That's a good thing. That's a good thing. Because, see, typically in that day, whenever you, you won the battle and Barak won the battle, you get the honors of slaying the general. It's war, right? This is, this is wartime. And so you know that, that this king, he comes and uh, Sisera comes and he's tired. He's running from the battle and he finds this home where he's going to uh, go and lay down and take a rest. And as he comes to take a rest at Heber's, Heber's house, rather, Heber's house, he goes in to take a rest, and there's a lady named J.L. there. Remember her? She grabs a stake, and she goes up, and she drives it in his head and kills him. The point of that story is to illustrate again to Barak. It's not you that ultimately wins the battle. And any sense of pride you might have in yourself that I did it, I'm going to show you in this story, in this instance, that you didn't do it. For in that day, for a woman to be the one to win the battle over the king, to kill the king, to, to celebrate that would be something of a reminder of him being brought down in his little pride and making him humble. I love what D.L. Moody once said. He said, it's wonderful what God will do with someone who refuses to keep the credit. That's the story of Eric. The next one in the line is Samson. We all know Samson, right? Samson's story you can read in Judges 13 through 16. And here's a story in this moment where he is facing struggles and challenges. And it demonstrates here a faith that rescues his past failures. You see, with Gideon, he knows that it's not in my strength. 300 men, that's not really what won the battle. It's the Lord who did that. Barak realizes that though we did what God called us to do, God in the end is the one who so arranged the victory that it removes my personal pride. And Samson shows us that even though you have messed up in your life as a follower of God, God will in the end still demonstrate his power through you and put you on a display as one of those who has genuine faith in God. We all remember his story, right? Samson is the guy who should be singing that little song, Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see, right? If he would have sung that song and lived by that song, he wouldn't have been in the predicament that he found himself in. But here is the man who forgot all that, who had this love for Delilah, and he went after a passion and a pleasure of his, kept revealing to her inch by inch his real secret to his strength, which was his hair, which really wasn't his hair. Uh, it's that's a symbolic of really his Nazarite vow and his commitment to God. And what he's doing is he's, he's backing off his commitment to what he told God he would be and how he would follow him. So his eyes fell on Delilah and she coaxed him out of his secret and she had him as he was laying in her lap, cut his hair, and you know, they came in, they grabbed him, they tied him up, they gouged out his eyes and they made a mockery of him. You know, that whole story is another one of those reminders, isn't it, of the binding, blinding power of sin. Uh, we often think that this will never really get me. It won't really do that to me. I know it's done it to others, but it won't do it to me. That's the deception of that, the binding, blinding power of sin. Let me tell you something else just thought of here about the story of Samson. Often in Samson's life, step after step, he still kept finding his strength was there, right? He could conquer to some degree. He would overcome to some degree. Until that fatal verse where it says, and the spirit of the Lord left him and he didn't know it. You see, God wasn't saying it's okay what you're doing and I'm giving you strength and it's okay what you're doing. It was just God's way of being merciful to him, giving him time to repent. But that day came where God took his hand off of him and he's captured 
They gouge out his eyes. It's the blinding, binding power of sin. But you know the end of the story, at the very end, where they're mocking him, making fun of him. He is there with his hands holding onto the pillars of that city, and he pulls them down and he destroys them. He goes down in his last final effort as killing more Philistines, more of the enemies of God than he did any other time in his life. You see, the wonderful news at the end of his life is this, is that your failures are not final. Yes, you have paid a price for what you have done. And yes, you have suffered. But faith, even in the most challenging, difficult time, says that it will rescue your reputation from the past. Next is Jephthah. Jephthah is in Judges chapter 11. And this was a man, by the way, in case you don't know his story real quickly, is a man who was an illegitimate son from a prostitute. His mom was a prostitute. Jephthah was unloved. He was rejected. His mom didn't want him. Nobody wanted him. He was the street child. That's Jephthah. He grew up in the back alleys of eastern Syria, just a little nasty, dirty kid running around with nobody caring for him. So finally one day, Jephthah heard the message of God and he decided he would follow it. And God took this little boy and raised him to be a general of the armies of Israel and to be one of Israel's judges against the Amorites. Jephthah appears only briefly in scripture, just a short little part of his story. Yet it's long enough to teach us this very basic lesson. Jephthah demonstrates a faith that reverses his ungodly heritage. Think about this. Some of you have probably come from a background to where you really didn't grow up in a Christian home and the best of the world surrounds you, maybe in a pretty bad situation, maybe even unwanted, unloved, and uncared for. And yet what does God do? God rescues people like you to himself. Like a Jephthah, your life of faith, now following this God, courageously trusting him in some of the most difficult things you've come out of reverses really that kind of heritage for sure. David, we know his name. You'd expect him to be there, right? You'd expect David to be in the list. And here what he does is David demonstrates a faith that resists personal impossibilities. And I'm thinking back to the story of David as it is unfolded in 1 Samuel 17 where he's facing the giant Goliath. And I think that's what he's referring to when we read the verses that just summarize everything in a moment in Hebrews 11 uh, verse 32 following. You'll see that he's obviously thinking about David facing Goliath. You remember the story, right? Everybody in Israel is scared to death of this giant. This is a struggle. This is a challenge. Nobody's up for the fight. Nobody has courageous faith. They're all running away. And here comes this little shepherd boy with a sling. And as one commentator said, while Goliath is laughing, David is loading. <laughs> He's getting ready. His faith is not in that sling. That's the instrument God used. His faith is in God. And he says this day to Goliath, the Lord will deliver you up into my hands and I will strike you down and remove your head from you. A little shepherd boy, impossible task that for everybody except the shepherd boy, not because of his sling and not because of his stones, but because of his great faith in God. He's the kind of guy who says, I care more about the name of God and the difficulty and the challenges before me. I care more about his name than what's going to happen to me. Everybody else was concerned about what would happen to them. They ran away. He resists that and then says, nope, if God's called us to this, we will see it happen. And then finally, Samuel and the prophets. Listed there in Hebrews 11, that's the last group that he mentions. And they are the ones who demonstrate a faith that rises above personal pressure. Now, why is that? Now, listen very carefully. All five individuals that have led in battles and armies are different than Samuel and the prophets in this sense. All these others are fighting enemies. Listen very carefully. Samuel and the prophets are fighting the people of God. It's their own families who are resisting God and his word. It's their own families who are turning to Baal and all the worship of pagan gods around them. You talk about having courage in your family and needing to rise up and to say, no, he is the true God. To be like a Jeremiah who is the weeping prophet who goes to tell the people of God, the nation that God has chosen for himself, who what the truth is. And they're not going to listen. Not one of them are going to pay any attention to him. 
This is like Samuel. This is like the prophets. They rise up to the pressure of rejection from the closest ones around them who love them and, and are their family, but don't love their God and don't want him at all. Listen, I'm telling you, courageous faith probably is more difficult in the context of Samuel and the prophets than it is with Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, or David. That's harder. You can fight your battle out there with them and then leave. And then you hope to come home to the fortress of your family and your home where there is this great love for God and this joy and this support for one another. But Samuel and the prophets didn't get to come home to a house like that. They didn't come home to a culture like that. They came home to a place to where there was personal pressure put on them all the time to turn away from God, to tone it down, to tune it down, to make less of this and quit being so radical. But that's the kind of prophets God called that's the way Samuel and the prophets were. That's a lot of lives, six lives, more counting all the prophets that go with it. But it summarizes itself beginning in verse 33. And I just read in closing. Who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the store, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. These are just reminders in the end here of these first verses that we've been looking at of the first kind of thing that courageous faith shows itself in. And that is that it conquers in the midst of incredible struggles that you face. Now, we're done. And what I hope is that as we've walked through this today and we've thought about Rahab, thought about the Jerichos, we thought about all these others that our time doesn't permit us to really talk a lot about. I hope that what you are seeing is that your life and my life of faith is often just like theirs. Jerichos are before us. Seemingly impre Im impenetrable obstacles, people, situations, health things, whatever it is, are before us. And we can be like the first generation and complain and grumble about it, or we can say, I'm going to trust God and do what he tells me to do, to obey him, to follow him, and I'll let him do what he says he's going to do in his way and in his time. God's going to do that in all of our lives. And I guarantee you, like these last six that we looked at, somewhere in your life right now, you can identify with one of those six categories. That's what the word is intended to do to you when we think about courageous faith, to see what really was ultimately the source of their confidence and their courage. To be like a Rahab and remember that the reason I have such confidence is because this great, awesome, terrible God who is a God of judgment and wrath on those who are disobedient welcomes gladly sinners who turn in their worst of their sin and their most horrific lives of, of waste turns to him and believes. That gives me great assurance that if he didn't spare his only son but delivered him up for me, gave him over to death on the cross, how will he not with him also freely give us everything? Whatever I'm facing, whatever Jericho, whatever battle, whatever struggle I'm facing, that gospel, that is the truth that really ignites and secures a confident and courageous faith in that God. That's what I hope you have. That's what I hope you develop. And that's why in community groups, you get to talk about that. You get to unfold your stories and those challenges. And you get to pray for one another. And you get to encourage one another. And you get to remind each other, remember that God? Don't, let's not be like those first generation Israelites. Let's be like the second generation Israelites. Let's really have a courageous faith. That's what community group can do for you. And I hope you will plug into that and you'll find yourself benefiting immensely from it. Let's pray.